Hey kid, you wanna learn a secret? All right, don't tell nobody this, but there's a secret treasure trove of literature hidden away in odd corners of the internet. But the best part is, it's all free, if you can find it. Now I'll tell you how to get your grubby hands on it, but first, I gotta learn you how to appreciate it, or else you'll read it backwards or upside down or something, capiche? What is it? It's hypertext fiction, of course. Why don't you sit back while old Slaz spins a yarn into a web? A world wide web. There's so much smoke in here. The year is 1989, and the nerds over at CERN have a problem. So, what else is new? Their particle smasher is so complicated that they just occasionally lose documentation on how it functions. This sends them into emergency mode enough times that they go, Right, we need to make a change. Get Berners-Lee on it. Pronto. So here enters Sir Tim Berners-Lee. CERN had only just recently promoted him to the level of top, top, G. top G. And so leveraging his position, he wrote a memorandum to upper management called Information for Brokies. Broke. In it, he details how the current Unix-based system is suffering from an overly rigid structure. The strict hierarchical organization combined with a list of keywords that was constantly in flux made for an information center that made the average researcher say, Excuse me, could you help me figure out how to how to work this thing? I can't access the information that I wrote down a week ago. I mean, why? To remedy this, Berners-Lee writes about his experience using hypertext to organize large amounts of data across a multi-user network. This is all nerd talk to say that Timmy here is the inventor of the World Wide Web, and at the center of the robust global network it has become today was Timmy's fascination with hypertext. So let's talk about what hypertext is. Quoting Berners-Lee's memorandum, hypertext is a term coined in the 1950s by Ted hey. Nelson, which has become popular for these systems, although it is used to embrace two different ideas. One idea, which is relevant to this problem, is the concept. Hypertext, human readable information linked together in an unconstrained way. Put simply, hypertext is the interactable elements on web pages. Go ahead and scroll around, take note of everything you can click on. All of it is hypertext, or hypermedia for video players and linked images. The ingenious part of this was the readability of hypertext. It's images, it's banners, and it's the Queen's English. Uh, or, I mean the, uh, the King's English. Information was so immediately accessible to users that researchers at CERN were able to hop into a COD lobby like 24 years before the first game released. I'm, I broke my controller. You broke your controller? <laughs> <laughs> This is Hypermedia, the ability to link related ideas in the form of text, graphics, or even full motion video on your personal computer. By the early 90s, hypertext became common fashion in the computer world, and in 1993, CERN announced that it would be freely available to the rest of the world. As this would align with consumer demand for home computers, the general populace was plugging in for the first time. They had access not only to a globalized network of information, but other users as well. From terminal to terminal, the first chat rooms came to life with fuzzy little messages. They said hi, and everyone was really impressed. But if you really want to entertain a person, you have to give them a story. So that's exactly what they did for one another. Hypertext fiction is a genre of literature characterized by its use of hypermedia and its break from the traditional narrative structure. We're done with the historical context at this point. For now, we can move on to the fiction. Chapter 2. The Fiction. There's a good chance you already know hypertext fiction, but have never encountered the phrase. Homestuck, the SCP Foundation, and Creepypasta as a medium are all considered to be works of hypertext fiction due to their use of hypermedia to tell a story. I'll break down every piece of fiction and highlight what it does well as hypertext literature, because I'm the person who did the research, not get to say which story is good and which is bad. And you'll never guess which the bad one is. 
but in service of retention rates, we'll work through examples of hyperfic from worst to best, so let's just rip the band-aid off. Homestuck came out in 2008 and ran for the entirety of Obama's presidency. It is simply too long. Over 8,000 pages of comic with variable lengths of dialogue makes Homestuck a slog to get through. However, being that this was my first venture into hypertext fiction, I was enthralled by the potential of the genre. On page one, we have the character introduction, and on page two, we have the reveal of an interactive element to the story. Kinda. See, when Homestuck came out in 2008, the author had the audience make decisions on what the on-screen character would do. This led to a long, bumbling prologue to the greater story, which is exactly the kind of introduction the story should have. Though it can often meander into trivial details or in-character quibbling, there's something magnetic about the next button. You click it and the next page is displayed, but you'll never really guess what comes next. The tumbling nature of the narrative certainly causes some confusion in retelling, but like a game of Dungeons and Dragons, it's the experience of being in the thick of it that holds reverence in the minds of readers. There's really nothing else quite like Homestuck, and once you really sink into the world of an apocalyptic video game parody, the audience-focused experience reels in readers by dashing expectations at every page. This is all without mentioning the climaxes of Homestuck, which receives special treatment in the form of fully animated sequences backed by original scores from the likes of Toby Fox, the sole creator of Undertale. Many people who have struggled through Homestuck tell prospective readers that they should skip a good way into the story, starting somewhere around where the trolls appear. Thanks to the non-linear structure of hypertext fiction, this is a valid suggestion for optimizing the reading experience, and if you're looking to at least dip your toes into the comic without caring too much about finishing it, the entire thing is free to navigate on the official Homestuck website. Just don't buy the physical copies. They're not only ugly, they're downright disgraceful to the genre they were adapted from. I can't click a book, Andrew Hussey, that's the name of the author. Uh, hey, hey Hussey, I can't click a book, so what gives? Why adapt it into an inferior physical copy? What, to keep it around when the internet inevitably stops existing? Well, good idea. Let's future-proof any and all artistic endeavors by muddling their best qualities into an inferior technology. You've done it again, hussy. You've done it again. Chapter 3. The Fiction. Part 2. Listen up, kid. If you thought reading hypertext would be easy, I don't know what to tell you. This is secret literature, after all. I.e., it's not meant for the masses. I expected that you would expect some difficulty from what is ostensibly a more complicated version of a book. So, if you can't handle anything a little more challenging than Harry Potter, go take your wand and your angry inch back to the library. But don't use the computers they got there. Those are for the real cats. Now, for those of us who can withstand a real story, I got something a little more out there. A man-like beast with a slender figure, but an atmosphere of untold horrors all around it. Next is the mythos of the slender man. That's it, that's the one. Print it. Slender Man is undeniably one of the most iconic characters to originate out of hypertext fiction. Born from a horror-themed Photoshop contest in an online forum called Something Awful, Slender Man is the internet's greatest urban legend. Is it scary? Mm -hmm. Kinda. The idea was reiterated by a number of dedicated creative types piecing together a sprawling online mythos. Long-form content like Marble Hornets and the slew of video games with Slender Man as the antagonist created an eerie, distant threat out of what was once just a subtly creepy series of images. Slender Man wasn't the identity of a man, but a malicious entity with unknowable motives. It was the cosmic horror equivalent of stranger danger. The myth has circulated long enough that the original images lack the shock of their initial release, but the fact is that these are legitimate pieces of art which influence the creation of a grander narrative. 
Forget how Hollywood let us down as always, it's more important that we recognize the real ambition of artists inspired by their community. The hypertext aspect then comes retrospectively, as there is no intention of creating a greater mythos when it began. The connections that can be drawn here are lines of inspiration, and despite not all creepypasta necessarily fitting into this categorization, Slenderman is the premier example of the medium, and likely the best candidate for most popular hyperfic character. It is a real shame the lack of respect internet-made content receives from traditional media, as any future creative would be able to tell you their first time encountering the entity, but we'll have our time in the future. If we make it to the future, that is. Oh, Chapter 4, The Fiction, Part 3, Act 1. Who cares? Sweet We're not gonna Jesus make it! Christ. The darkness of our universe is God's oh, open God. mouth. SCP is classified as chumbo horror. It was me, I classified it that way. What gives me the right? Well, I'm a member of the Foundation, of course. I'm an ultra-high Mandalorian-class research and development specialist who whittles away their time at a government black site waiting for the next containment breach. There are two states the Foundation is in at any given time, panic mode and emergency mode, and I haven't had a good panic attack in three years. So what makes the SCP Foundation the only member of the chumbo horror subgenre? It's so hilariously cosmic in proportion, the only way to encapsulate how silly the power leveling works between monsters is to just gesture towards the really cool end sequence in Cabin in the Woods and say, yeah, it's like that, but everyone takes it really seriously, and if you try to show your dad the site one day, you'll click the random article button with a wager that you'll land on a Hugo Award winning piece of science fiction, only be met with an article of a cow comprised entirely of lima beans. SCP-843 dash one contains five lima bean seeds as well as a piece of paper proclaiming the items within to be cow seeds suffice it to say scp is a bit of a mixed bag each article is given specialized format for people to flex their creativity this usually ends up being some horrific planet-eating monstrosity that cannot be dealt with by normal science fiction means no, in order to stop SCP-55000, we have to denounce our calculators and talismans of science in favor of the Elder Gods. And then after all that is done, then we can measure how tall the Elder Gods are. All this might sound like a critique of the site and its endeavors, but it's quite the opposite. I'm not the most attentive of it, but SCP has always been on the peripheral of my eclectic interests, and there was a time where all I did was scour the site for the next new bit of lore. I no longer remember the numbers of the items I most liked, and the community has continued to write in my absence, but my favorite articles concerned masks which transported you to another dimension, a vending machine that would disperse foodstuffs from an alternate universe, and a short story titled Document Recovered from the Marianas Trench. That last one really tickled me with the apocalypticism, as it depicted a pre-flood society which lived at the cusp of a canyon until horrible demonic creatures rose up one day and tore the society apart. The whole landmass floods, the canyon becomes the trench, and the fertile common ground for civilization is now reclaimed seafloor. Scary stuff. There's even a sister website now which caters to fantasy writing, and I think I'd like to get involved with that one because, I'm, you know, why not? But what makes the SCP Foundation the best piece of hypertext fiction thus far? Sheer volume is absolutely taken into account, but so is the variety and quality of content. I made a gaffe out of SCP-843 just earlier, but I can absolutely recognize its place on the site as an early notion of what items were meant to be. If it's anomalous, it belongs in the Foundation, and that's where research can take place. It's a simple, men in black premise taken to an extreme extent, and I love it. There's even been an entire subgenre of first person horror games which have evolved from the narrative constraints of the original site. Wow, the blinking is annoying, my guy. Have you played SCP before? This is, this is normal SCP. Damn, have we started to reach the curve where people don't know about the mechanics from base SCP containment breach? Like, it, are, am I getting so old that was what what was once 
an incredibly popular game of this genre has become something where people are like, that mechanic, why are they doing this? <laughs> Which in turn evolved from a random 4chan post on SCP-173. That 4chan post was the origination of the entire premise. Now look at where we are. The internet is truly a hotbed for creativity, and although I have saved SCP Foundation for this far into the video, I have one more piece of hyperfic to talk about. One that I think outstrips the Foundation only through the fact that you can sit down and read the whole thing in one sitting, like I did. It's called, to the dismay of fans everywhere, 17,776. Alright kid, I'll be honest. I didn't bring you into this for no reason. I need to come clean about why I'm telling you all this. You see, I wanted to be a writer. And the fic I'm about to show you was what made me realize I could be one. But I've spent too long chasing my own tail. I'm past my prime and too much of a 1930s noir detective to know how to work a computer. I'm no Rick Decker after all. So take what I'm about to show you with some reverence, because it's the only reason I bothered to get your attention in the first place. Glimpse into the future, where man has solved all their problems, and now has no worry of death, or disease, or pain whatsoever. Peer into a strange, possible world where we achieve all of our goals, except for one. Curing boredom. 